When I was a kid, my dad had a print in his office with a quote attributed to President John F. Kennedy. One man, one person can make a difference, and everyone should try. Today's guest is the author of a series of books for young readers inspired by that same sense of idealism. She's Chelsea Clinton this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, scholars, journalists, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Chelsea Clinton, who is the best-selling author of a number of books, including Start Now, You Can Make a Difference. Chelsea, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So you have really sort of this, this wonderful educational pedigree, Stanford and Columbia for Public Health and a doctorate from Oxford, and you're writing books for young readers. Why is that audience important to you? Well, I really think children's books are when we first say to kids, here's what's possible for you, or unfortunately, here's what's not possible for you. And particularly as an advocate and educator, but especially as a mom, I think it's really important that we say to kids early on, you can be a positive force in the world. Maybe the world for now is kind of your home, your school, um, but it is also kind of your community and our shared planet. Uh, so I couldn't imagine doing anything else than what I'm doing right now, including writing children's books. Is there a book that you look back to when you were a young, young doll, young person that sort of still carries with you today? Completely. So I, I read a book called 50 Simple Things Kids Can Do to Save the Earth when I was 10 or 11 and um, kind of radically tried to do every single one of them probably the same day. <laughs> um, and you probably didn't succeed well, at least in I one day. Well, I didn't succeed all in one day. Um, and thankfully, my parents my grandparents were really supportive of me doing things like walking around our neighborhoods with cut up kind of um, plastic soda can rings, trying to tell people it was really important to cut them up before they threw them away so that in Arkansas we weren't, you know, responsible for choking kind of fish and wildlife in the Gulf of Mexico, I was very dramatic That's as a child. <laughs> um, and you know, thankfully I had parents who understood that that drama needed kind of healthy direction um, and kind of outlets. And so you know, start now in some ways really came out of like looking for like what was the version of 50 simple things kids can do today. Um, I have uh, close to two dozen nieces and nephews and so was really looking for kind of what can I kind of share with them, how can I try to help them translate what they want to do into like real things they can do so they see themselves make a difference. Um, and now it's so fun kind of hearing from kids who tell me, including my nieces and nephews, like what they're doing inspired by my book. Did you love to read as a kid? Always. Not just the book that you mentioned, but... Always. I've always loved to read and I've always loved to read fiction and nonfiction, and I'm so thankful to my parents, my grandparents, but also my really great teachers. Like I remember fourth grade, I had Mrs. Porter, we read Bridge to Terabithia, kind of where the red fern grows. I mean, some pretty heavy things yeah. kind of for fourth grade, but also that she trusted us, you know, as, as readers, as people that we could handle kind of those heavier stories and kind of make sense of them in our own lives, not kind of be crushed by them, but kind of hopefully to be inspired by them. I still can't talk about where the red fern grows, so that's just... <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to put you Dog on the spot. Dog stories just destroy we'll me. Move, <laughs> we'll move along. Where did you find your voice to write books for young readers? I mean, you've written, obviously, many books for adults. It's a very different craft, technique, and talent. And I would argue most people, many people can't, easily transition. So that's a long way of saying, how did you find your voice? By spending time with lots of kids. I mean, by listening to kids kind of talk about the world, kind of what questions they were grappling with, kind of what they wanted to do, how they were supporting each other, challenging each other, and then kind of 
relying on a lot of those kids to be honest readers of drafts, like, you know, asking them for their feedback, like, did this make sense to them? Like, did they understand what this word meant? Like, would they have said something differently? You know, in my book, Don't Let Them Disappear, where I write about animals, like, were these really kind of animals they cared about? Were, were I missing animals? So really deeply engaging with kind of kids who I hope would be representative of, of kids who would read my so, books. So they were almost like your editors? or, or Totally, like my name? readers, my editors, my kind of own focus groups in some ways. And I'm hugely thankful to very, all the kids smart for their too, time. The sort very of related smart. to that, there was, the, so one of the things that struck me was uh, early in the book you talk about waterborne illness. And you don't mix poop and water. Well, that's it. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and I sort of it's chuckled to myself direct. a little bit. But there was a candor and an honesty and a frankness about it that that I think would resonate. It was that that had to be intentional. Completely intentional. And also now, as a parent, I see kind of my kids, especially my daughter, really, she's five, so she's like old enough, she really like understands how to wash her hands, the importance of drying off her hands. And now she'll repeat back to me, like, you know, don't mix poop and water, mommy. I'm like, that's right, sweet girl. That's right. Do you have any concern that, that you could encourage a, a fear that would be overblown or, or too extreme? In other words, kids would read this and go, start to get a little bit iffy about things. I mean, I hope that um, I'm not encouraging anxiety. I hope that I actually am helping uh, empower kids to translate whatever um, they're worried about or concerned about into something they actually can do. Because I think we want kids to feel empowered and not disempowered. And I think even really young kids, I mean, my daughter's five and she is so worried about sharks and the health of the ocean. And I would far rather her think, okay, I can recycle, I can try to limit what I use, I can raise awareness about kind of why no one should ever eat shark fin soup. Like these are things I can do so she feels empowered instead of just being crushed by kind of worries that you know, all the sharks are going to die by the time she's my age. So I think... I, I think the tone and, yeah. and voice of your books, this one in particular, do that. I think, oh, you, well, achieve, you. I think you achieve that. Well, so you cover a lot of, lot of topics in, in, in Start Now. You've got uh, sort of uh, health and nutrition and vaccines and bullying. How did you decide which topics to try to cover in, in this book? Again, kind of back to our earlier conversation, really listening to kids. Um, listening to kids sometimes in kind of a purposeful way in that I'd ask questions like, what's really on your mind? Kind of what's weighing heavily on your heart? Like, what are you involved in? What do you want to do? And then also just kind of when I was on previous book tours, just the questions kids would ask me. And I was asked so often about bullying. I think in every event that I had with kids, I was asked, like, how do you deal with bullies? What would you kind of recommend to someone who's dealing kind of with bullying? How can I be kinder? How can I support my friends? So all these just different questions around this issue of bullying. So I knew I had to How would you that. respond to that question? Well, the, you know, trying to say to kids, like, yes, like, I have been bullied in my life, and I am really thankful that I've always understood it's about the bully and not about me. And I have to think about, like, how do I stand up for this in a way that is safe and also when should I ask for help? I think it's really important kind of we help kids understand sometimes the right thing to do is stand up for themselves, stand up for their friends and sometimes the right thing to do is ask a trusted adult and they should feel kind of equally strong and empowered and good about making whichever of those is the right decision in whatever situation they're in. So at a macro level, climate change clearly is a very pressing problem. Just talk a little bit about what you conveyed in Start Now for people who may not have read it, and then ex explicate a little bit more on that too. Sure. So you know, this book really is for kind of early elementary school readers, so kind of okay. six, seven, eight, nine, maybe ten-year-olds. Um, although my husband very sweetly told me he learned things. <laughs> he's like, he's my kind of ultimate, he's my, he's my ultimate editor. Yeah, he did, he had to say that. He said maybe it wasn't totally true. Well, I think it's also um, read it and learn. I, I think there's no question about it. I say that, though, um, because I do want kids to feel like, you know, there are things that adults should be doing, like changing how we produce energy, changing how we use energy. And then there are also things that kids can be doing, both for themselves and with their families, reducing their carbon footprint, 
recycling, reusing things when they can, turning off the lights, taking shorter showers. We as adults, I think, should be doing all of that and a lot more. I think that it's really important that kids feel like they could be part of the solution too, even if maybe they can't change to solar energy in the way that I hope well, you know, communities do. One of the things do. that I really enjoyed about the book, though, were the, the, the profiles that you include of of the kids, young, yes. young, young kids doing things, doing not waiting for their parents to save the world. Things. Doing amazing things. I mean, even in, in this kind of broader umbrella of fighting climate change, I mean, the kids who are leading anti-idling efforts at their schools so that kind of at pickup parents are turning off their cars and not just leaving their cars to idle, kind of leading efforts for clean water, whether that is in Flint, Michigan, or kind of to help build wells around the world. So, so much that kids are doing kind of in their community, kind of in our country and really around the world. So, do kids give you hope for the future? The optimism? Oh, completely. The activism and what you've seen and what you write about? Completely. I mean, I do have to own that I think optimism is a moral choice. I think it is a more moral place to be, kind of to Interesting. believe that we can have a better, brighter, healthier, more sustainable and equitable future. Because uh, I think cynicism just kind of gives us permission to do nothing. And I don't want to live in that kind of cynical mindset or place. Uh, and yet I absolutely draw huge amounts of both inspiration and optimism from the young people I write about in the book and the kind of many more that you know, I couldn't write about but that I know are doing amazing things every day. A sequel. Oh, maybe. <laughs> right. If, if, if you're listening, Jill, Jill, my wonderful editor. That's your editor. Do you, um, you know, there's, uh, you mentioned the, the students who are uh, trying to get their parents to stop idling. Uh, I was struck by the story of the students in Germany who were planting trees to address climate change. If you're a student and you sort of read this book, how do you, where do you start? What, 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 what do you look for? Do you look for something locally that you can address, or do you try to tackle these big global issues in one fell swoop? I think, Jim, there are as many right answers to that question as there are people who would ask it, right? I think um, maybe the right answer for you, because what you really care about is, is bullying, and you kind of try to convince your school to have a buddy bench so that if someone's feeling lonely, they can go sit on the buddy bench, and kind of other students then can come up and talk to you and quite literally like help you be less lonely because you're not alone. Maybe you really care about planting trees. You can go to the kind of U.S. Arbor Foundation and find out kind of what trees are appropriate for your environment, whether that's kind of here in Rhode Island or somewhere else, and kind of try to raise awareness about planting those trees or raise funds to help plant those trees in your kind of backyard even. So I think there's so many different things you can do based on what issue really galvanizes you and kind of whether you then take that energy kind of into your home or your school. Um, or kind of somewhere far, far away because you really want to save the polar bears and they're in the Arctic, like it all really matters. One of the themes that runs through this book and other books is involvement in public life. Talk about that. I mean, you clearly have lived some of that. What would you say to kids? We have kids here, live yeah, studio I mean, audience. I would say to the kind of the students here, in the same way that I say to my own kids who are much younger or any young person, like, you're already a citizen. Like, you don't become a citizen when you're old enough to vote. You're already a citizen. You have a powerful voice. You have agency. I hope that you'll use it, whether that is to kind of get your school to start a recycling program because that's kind of your public sphere today, or whether that's to write your local elected official because you think it should be illegal to sell ivory. It's still legal to sell ivory here in Rhode Island. We know that demand for ivory is the main reason why there's still so much illegal elephant poaching around the world. If we want to save elephants, we have to shut down ivory markets. If that's something that really kind of makes you angry here in Rhode Island, like write your state legislature, write your governor. So I would say absolutely it's so important to be involved publicly, whether that's with your elected officials or kind of your, your teachers or other parts of your kind of public sphere while you're growing up. What about encouraging your parents to also become involved? Completely. I think your parents, your grandparents, you know, your, your teachers, like any adults, whether that is voting, or I certainly hope it is voting, but also kind of t 
taking responsibility for whether that's kind of fighting climate change or, again, trying to save endangered species around the world. And one of the reasons I talk about endangered species so much and wrote a whole other book about them is it is the issue I've heard most consistently from kids around the country is kind of trying to help protect animals and local shelters or trying to save animals around the world. Do you get into children, youngsters, adolescents and social media at all in, in, in your writing or, or in your talks and addresses and, and or parenting. Lots of different questions there. Yeah, I, mean, I do a lot of questions there, but what, what's sort of your general advice or Well or absolutely. Guidance? I mean in, in Start Now I talk about um, cyberbullying and how important it is that we are kind to one another um, in cyberspace and stand up kind of in cyberspace when we see kind of people being bullied, whether that's in kind of group chats or kind of on larger social media platforms, because we know that is where a lot of bullying, unfortunately, um, happens. And often um, bullying will start in kind of cyberspace and online fora and then migrate into kind of face-to-face, -face, whether that's in the school hallways or kind of elsewhere where kids spend time. So I do think it's hugely important that we teach kids how to be kind to one another, how to also support one another, how to be allies online, hopefully in the same way I hope kind of schools are doing kind of in, in classrooms and, and in real life. Um, and elsewhere, not in this book, but elsewhere I have you know, strongly come out in favor of um, not kind of giving children technology when they're very young, really limiting children's use of technology, helping them kind of become kind of smart uh, digital citizens, kind of helping them with media literacy, I think is all really important. So while I don't talk about that here, I do kind of talk and write about it, that elsewhere. Do, do you think that the you know, social media companies are being responsible players in this space? No, not generally. Um, I find it really um, troubling how um, narrowly they often define kind of hate speech or bullying, um, particularly when it comes to kids, how hard it is for parents and, and teachers or even school districts to get certain language taken down. Um, I don't think that should be so hard. Um, I think there are a lot of really smart people at those companies. And a lot of people who work at those companies. Yeah, yeah. who really, um, I wish, would kind of take a more active view and a more kind of um, lens of really protecting children uh, than I certainly well, uh, believe all, them to be doing at the moment. It almost seems like the like it exposes the thin veneer of civilization, right? That, that you hide behind a computer screen, people say all manner of terrible things that I don't think they would ever say face to face. Oh, I don't know. People say, pe everything that someone has said to me online, they've said to me in person. <laughs> I think it maybe just gives people like a greater opportunity. To, to do it. To do it. Yeah. Um, but, but for me, like I'm, I'm an adult and I can handle that. And I also right. kind of grew up having to handle yeah, right. that. And then I think about these kids today who so much of their lives is online and they don't know how to handle that. We're not doing a good enough job of protecting them or empowering them to know how to handle it, but I don't think it should all be on them. I do think the platforms have a real responsibility here. Yeah. Well, one of the things, one of the other themes that I thought emerged from Start Now was this idea that taking care of yourself is part of taking care of the broader world. There's a link between us as individuals and how we treat ourselves and sort of the broader world within which we live. Can you just sort of unpack that a little bit for us? Absolutely, I mean, I fundamentally believe, and I think we, we have a lot of research to back this up, that you know, if we do kind of take better care of ourselves, not only kind of with our nutrition or sleep or things that we historically have thought that to mean, but also kind of how we take care of ourselves mentally, um, we are more likely to kind of engage positively in the world. And we know there is a real cycle there. Kind of the, the more kids are kind, the more likely they are to be kind to others and to themselves. And that may seem obvious, but we now have real research to back that up. So kind of even three acts of kindness a week for kids helps them feel better about themselves, helps them continue to be kind, which then helps them to feel better about themselves. So I do believe all of this is really interconnected. Positive reinforcement. Yes. Yeah. So emo emotional well-being is important. Hugely important. I think emotional well-being is hugely important. 
How do you recommend young people stay informed? You hit some major issues in the news today, facing the planet today, from endangered species to climate change, and we've talked about some of the others. What do you recommend children do in terms of learning? I think it depends. Reliably, authoritatively learning. Yeah, well, I think it depends partly on kind of what issue they really do care most about. So, you know, I, I'm often asked by kids, like, how do I stay informed? Or how did I even get the information for this book? And I love it. Um, no offense to you, but I love it when kids especially ask that question because they're already then thinking, how do they themselves find these reliable sources of information? So you know, whether it's endangered species, I say, absolutely, I hope that you'll go to the Wildlife Conservation Society and the World Wildlife Fund. You know, not that there isn't great kind of reporting on these issues, but it's often episodic and sporadic, and you can just go closer to the source, closer to the expertise, or whether it's climate change. I mean, the UN kind of climate change reports are pretty um, scientifically heavy, and by the time someone's in high school, they may be able to navigate through that. But the UN and others have really tried to have like kid-friendly information sources. So I just point them to kind of what I believe to be the really authoritative sort of and like primary non primary sources. Primary sources and, yeah. and kind of non non political, just primary sources, real experts talking about whether it's climate change or endangered species or other things they may care about. So obviously you recommend finding places where facts and truth matter. Yes. As opposed to places where facts and truth don't matter. Yes. <laughs> and there are certainly a Which lot of shouldn't be a controversial position and yet often I know. Is. It's like often really is. like yeah. no Do you, kidding. So it strikes me too that there is uh, some well, I'll just ask, is sure. there a direct tie between what you're doing in these books and the work that you're doing with the Clinton Foundation? Absolutely, in some areas. So one of the big areas where we do a lot of work with the Clinton Foundation is through a program called Too Small to Fail, um, which is a nationwide program where we try to really meet parents and caregivers where they are so that parents and caregivers understand how important it is to read, sing, and talk to even our littlest kids, because 80% of our brains are built by the time we're three. And so we know it's really important that kids are in kind of language rich environments. And so we've kind of opened libraries now in I think more than 600 laundromats. Kind of we work with Scholastic oh, that's a great idea. and others to give books to pediatricians offices. I think there now have been hundreds of thousands of books distributed to pediatricians offices. We're in kind of WIC clinics, so kind of low income kind of new mom clinics uh, to really try to help uh, just remind um, parents and caregivers, how important it is they talk to their kids just about anything, like the color of the table, like what they're seeing on the bus as it's driving by or kind of what they're seeing while they're doing laundry. So that is certainly clearly connected to me, trying to help ensure that kind of every kid has kind of what, what they need to kind of have a good start in life. Um, clearly part of that for me is like empowering kids, but a lot of that is helping kids just learn to read. We've hit on this a little bit, but I want to get into it maybe a little bit more. Sure. You're a mother now. You have three children. How has that changed your perspective on children and your writing? One of the things I really noticed um, in a deeper sense when I became a mom um, for the first time with our daughter Charlotte was how many kids' books are centered around boys and male voices. Oh, like true. how many even animal yeah characters have have male names and then have kind of a male voice and perspective on the world. Like, I don't know why we have felt the need to gender frogs or pigs or cows, but, but they <laughs> often are. And, I can't think of a reason yeah, that either, can you? And, no. and, it's and crazy. so that, I, I knew like the data, wow, like most kids literature over time really has been centered on boys, but I, until I was reading these books to my daughter, I didn't quite realize like how profound that felt to me and then how troubling that was to me and that's part of what kind of compelled me to write She Persisted and and She Persisted Around the World and then later coming this year She Persisted in Sports because I just thought oh my gosh we need kind of more stories that are just unapologetically about and celebrating girls and women for young readers for for girl readers but also for boy readers like it matters to me that my sons also hear hear these yeah, stories of course. and my daughter's obsessed with wonder woman which is awesome <laughs> and, and awesome for her but also awesome because since my son worships his big sister if you ask him like who's your favorite superhero for a while he said batman but now he says wonder woman too and i think that's, that's pretty, pretty awesome. great yeah. yeah yeah do you um 
you know, when you think about the sort of, you know, the, the world that we're giving our kids uh, and the world that the kids that you're writing to are, are going to inherit, uh, are you optimistic? I mean, the, the, some of the challenges that we face are, are daunting. Uh, just the climate challenge alone is sort of one that I think overwhelms a lot of us. Where, where do you come down on that? Well, I have to be optimistic because I have to believe that we still can at least mitigate the damage um, that is on the horizon. Um, it is, though, challenging kind of back to the earlier comment about like facts and truth when there are people who are actively denying the science around climate change, kind of the real facts of the matter. It's the way I feel about kind of the anti-vax movement you know, not only in this country, but around the world that is making us so vulnerable. I mean, we've had more than 100 children die of the flu in the United States this year, the vast majority of whom weren't vaccinated. So I, I find that so, so deeply concerning and it makes me so angry in the same way. I'm deeply concerned and angry by the people who are ignoring the science of climate change and not doing kind of what I think, you know, they urgently need to be doing. And yet I have to believe that if we and if those of us who believe in science and truth and evidence keep pushing for it, we will be able to turn the tide. Chelsea Clinton, it's a remarkable book. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. <laughs>